welcome to everybody uh, who is watching us now here in the Zoom uh, room and also live on Facebook Live and on the other mm -hmm. possible uh, technical devices and everybody of you who is sitting at home um, in front of your, uh, your computers. Uh, a warm welcome symbolically from the Bruno Kreisky <laughs> Forum in, in Vienna because also myself, I'm not at the forum now, I'm at my home and uh, mm. I have very warm welcome to a long time friend, uh, James Galbright uh, to Texas. Jamie, it's wonderful to have you uh, again here in the Bruno Kreisky Forum. Uh, it would be a greater pleasure uh, if we would have the possibility to meet uh, physically, but uh, uh, in this year it's not possible, but probably or sure next year we will can we can welcome you in Vienna in our house again. Wonderful, Jamie, that you are here with us. Well, thanks very much. And it's a, always a pleasure to join you, whether virtually or in person. Uh, and Next time or again at the Heuriger in Wien Grinzig. Uh, James uh, Galbraith is, is one of the most prominent and pr prolific progressive economists in the US and in the global, and he's also a um, very prolific writer. He served at the US Congress as an um, economist. He has a chair at the University of Austin in Texas, uh, where he is now in Texas. Um, he is uh, prominent, for example, for his studies about um, inequality, and he had a voice in consulting governments, progressive go governments, especially around the globe, for example, the Syriza government in Greece. And he is, since decades, I had told already a friend of the Bruno Kreisky Forum, uh, as also his father, um, the legendary economist J uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith was already a friend of Bruno Kreisky himself. And he, your father was in the Kreisky Forum and in Kreisky's home in Vienna. And this is more than anecdotal in, in the context of our talk today, because um, given that your father, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith's record is New Deal intellectual and uh, mm -hmm. economist serving for Roosevelt's government and um, uh, consulting or working together with the Kennedy and Johnson government. Um, his, his record offers a lot of insights also that might be important uh, for a crisis situation or a not, uh, not normal situation as we are um, yeah, now and we have now our cal cal calamities with the health crisis on the one hand, on the other hand, um, with a deep economic crisis. Most uh, all all countries are in, and uh, but all in a different way. So, Jamie, one of your recent books, recent, uh, I think it's from 2016, um, was titled "The End of Normal." In the light of our calamities now, this sounds quite prophetic and also is a, a, a bit ironical. Uh, maybe you want to st start with your opening remarks about uh, our new abnormal we are living now, um, or about the new normal we are now and about the next normal uh, we might be, let's say, in the years to come. Uh, Jamie, um, the floor is yours for your opening remarks. Thank you very much. Robert, thank you very much. And I, again, let me just to express my pleasure being with you on this occasion. What I thought I would do uh, today is to um, take up the question in very broad and general terms of the effects of the pandemic on the structure of the of, of the world economy, uh, and um, therefore, by extension, uh, what we might garner from the experience we're going through uh, for the way we think about economic problems. Um, I spent quite a lot of time working on this, I mean, obviously diverted attention, and it seemed to me it should divert uh, not only one's physical activities, but one's scholarly and uh, research exercises from the moment that it hit. Uh, and uh, I spent the summer and, the, and um, the fall actually working with a, a substantial group of students uh, to try and, uh, and, and put together in my own mind uh, a, a, a simple coherent picture 
of where things stand. So what, what, did the, what did the pandemic actually do to us and why? And it struck me that the simple and single most uh, important fact uh, that is that it, uh, the pandemic was an explosive event. Uh, it was an event uh, the, uh, the spread of the, uh, of, the, of the contagion at the from the beginning was was extraordinarily rapid, and for that reason, it distinguished uh, between two broadly speaking two types of economies: those that could respond quickly and those that could not. Um, those that could respond quickly, that is to say, on the first day uh, that the warnings came out from uh, from China um, in early January. Uh, uh, and that could respond effectively, what were prepared, managed to do a much better job of suppressing uh, the contagion and may, therefore being able to restore ordinary life at a relatively early period than those that could not. Uh, so uh, what distinguished these two groups of countries? I would say uh, that broadly speaking, there was a set that were, we might describe as the most advanced industrial societies or post-industrial societies. Uh, that are form the the core of the of the world economic order, and those that uh, uh, are uh, what I want to call intermediate and then highly uh, um, industrialized manufacturing powers, but uh, not the ones at the at the front or the forefront or the center of the world system. Uh, and the interesting thing is that it was the first group of countries that did worse, and the second group of countries that did better. Uh, so that uh, if one looks at, uh, of course, the colossal example of China, but also Vietnam, also uh, the Republic of Korea, also Singapore, Hong Kong, um, also I don't, to take a, a, a more distant example, Cuba, uh, the, the countries that were that that were able to implement a supp suppression strategy uh, were those that uh, were, among other things. There was a preparedness uh, for dealing with infectious diseases. There were there were government institutions that could be mobilized quickly, uh, and there was productive capacity for the basic consumer goods protective equipment uh, that could be expanded very rapidly. As we know, China, for example, had a 10 million per day production of face masks at the start of February. It was 115 million per day at the end of February, less than in a month. Um, it went up by an extraordinary amount uh, because people, uh, lots of uh, firms, and this was not state enterprises, but thousands of small firms were present and were able to convert very quickly to meet the needs of the, of the situation. Uh, whereas if you go and look at uh, the big regions uh, that, uh, um, in which we happen to live in North America, uh, and in Europe and the United Kingdom, I draw that distinction because I have to be with the with the spirit of the times, uh, the, uh, these are, are, are polities uh, which are decentralized, um, where one has had a, uh, a rising dominance of uh, finance uh, and of advanced technologies, uh, a substantial measure of deindustrialization of what we used to think of as the core manufacturing sectors. They are decentralized. Um, they are, of course, politically uh, much more fragmented, in many cases highly polarized, with a great deal of distrust, both of government and of of, of any uh, of the uh, of the authority of of, uh, of professionals. Uh, and uh, in these places, uh, suppression uh, was not even really attempted. Uh, it was uh, the extent that it was attempted, it did not succeed. The best that could be done was to mitigate the virus. Uh, in other words, to hold it down so that it didn't overrun everybody and uh, keep the, and drive the basic healthcare out of existence. It was endangered in a few places. Uh, but uh, that was the best that could be achieved pending the um, introduction of a successful vaccine or a therapy. And we still don't have really very much in the way of a therapy, but we do now have the beginning of, a, of, of at least a potentially successful uh, vaccination process. Okay, so where uh, uh, where does this leave us for the post-pandemic period? It's a very interesting situation. Uh, among, on the one hand, the uh, uh, might say that the the intermediate powers, and some of them are socialists, and some of them are capitalist, uh, that did very well uh, have. 
uh, I think scored an immense uh, coup, if you like, in terms of their reputation, their their, their the sense of competence, uh, probably in the sense of self confidence and the authority of their of their governments uh, and their ability to deal with this crisis. I know that's certainly true uh, from my observations of, of of what's been going on in China, uh, and I'm sure it's true in in, in other places as well. Um, whereas uh, the uh, advanced, so-called advanced, I don't know if we're still advanced anymore, but the, the countries, uh, the regions that, uh, uh, that were uh, higher income and, uh, and, and globalized uh, and financialized uh, have a real reckoning uh, of their capacity going forward. In the US, I would say there are gonna be three major problems. The advanced sectors need to be repurposed uh, because nobody's gonna be using them for the same kinds of things that were used before the pandemic. Aircraft is an example, but the travel sector and all kinds of things which is not gonna be the same. Employment is gonna to have to be rethought because the services sectors will not grow back the same number of jobs they had before. Uh, and the financial relations are gonna to have to be revised because people are not gonna be able to pay the accumulated mortgages, rents, utility bills, student loans, healthcare loans, and all of this is going to be cost us an enormous amount of adjustment. But okay, last thing on the opening remark, and then I'll, 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 I'll subsist. It's still going to be true that if you move forward uh, toward the imperatives of the Green New Deal and 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 dealing with climate change in particular, it's the resources and capacities in the advanced countries that are going to have to be brought to bear because that's where. Uh, the shift in basically the ability to design a new way of living uh, is going to probably have to come from to a substantial degree. So a lot depends upon the capacity of the of so-called advanced regions to make that adjustment and come out of this thinking they're not going back to where they were before, but they have to do something new and they have to do it in a way that demonstrates a competence that they were not able to demonstrate over the past year. Okay. Uh, enough for for starters uh, thank um thank you jamie i have a lot a lot of questions beginning with uh, with your opening remarks uh, but about your opening remarks uh because uh, the point you made is that uh, this country that uh de decentralized a lot to, to, uh, a lot that uh, uh, were uh, the, were uh, had this hegemony of this uh, liberal capitalist mo model, financial capitalist model, going away from manufacturing like the US and, and Great Britain. Um, they did uh, worst, uh, and, um, uh, and a lot of Asian countries uh, did better um, uh, from China to Korea. And uh, for sure, they, uh, they have a much more centralized uh, uh, scheme of state in, in institutions, for sure, this is right. Uh, on the other hand, there might be other reasons too. <laughs> there might be other reasons too. Uh, for example, in most of the Asian countries, they had already the experience uh, with uh, SARS and MERS and other, uh, other pandemics. The, the idea that a pandemic could uh, hit the state was uh, it, it was there in Europe. It wasn't. It wasn't. We, know, we knew it maybe intellectual, uh, but uh, we didn't have the experience with that. That would be the first uh, question. How much would you uh, would you uh, would you give the responsibility to that uh, fact? And then we ca also can discuss. Um, for sure, the U.S. and uh, and uh, Great Britain did worst, and Brazil. But maybe we won't talk about Brazil because it's another type of economy. But um, also, uh, Sweden uh, did did not well. So we saw can also see that that countries that governments uh, that were were led by the concept of herd uh, immunity uh, uh, did worse. It, Maybe that is uh, more important than the economic doctrine. What would you uh, answer to, to this argument? Well, on, on the first point, I think uh, it's clear that having had experience and having maintained uh, an effective uh, structure for responding to um, new infectious diseases was critically important. Um, and, and you know, the countries that we're talking about 
um, didn't have that experience, but they also had much longer running experience and they had structures that went back uh, to the 50s and 60s uh, that uh, they were able to mobilize very quickly. Uh, and that was important. One, why did the, why did the um, North America and Europe not have this? Uh, uh, I think the answer is um, that, uh, first of all, austerity in Europe uh, had greatly weakened uh, the public health infrastructure. Uh, and in the United States, where I don't think one can fairly say the healthcare sector has been subject to austerity, it's practically 20% of an enormous GDP, uh, the structure of the sector uh, was not oriented toward infectious diseases and public health. Uh, it was oriented toward the kinds of things that Amer particularly upper income and middle class Americans have, which are are, are chronic conditions and uh, you know, individualized, uh, but not necessarily infectious or highly contagious uh, 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 health conditions. Um, and so there was a certain you know, mismatch between the challenge. Also, the Trump administration had dismantled what um, central focus there had been on the possibility of a, of a pandemic. So, uh, there was, the, 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 in some sense, the, the central nervous system that should have reacted had been already lobotomized. Um, they, um, so uh, these things are, did matter, uh, but what they played into, along with the capacity to act in a, in a, in a coherent way, uh, was the, the ability to deal, deal with this, as I say, from the beginning. Uh, if you act, if you jumped on it at the beginning and you closed your borders and you uh, imp implemented protocols and testing and contact tracing and uh, and if necessary lockdowns, uh, you could you had you stood a chance. Uh, if you didn't do that or if you couldn't do that, and of course the scale of a continental economy makes it very hard, uh, then uh, the thing was going to spread very rapidly, and you were going to be dealing with a much more difficult problem. Uh, and, um, and of course, be caught up. Not to say that every part of Europe was a, was in the, in the initial phases unsuccessful. I mean, I'm an impressionist Slovakia, for example, did a pretty good job uh, right from the beginning. And uh, uh, so, th to the extent that that I mean, there was there were possibilities uh, to uh, to handle this that were. Uh, not taken. And of course, you look at Sweden, the, the Swedish case is a deep contrast to its Scandinavian neighbors who uh, chose different policies and acted uh, in a more, uh, in a turned out more successful manner. It's hard to explain the Swedish case, except as an example of an experiment that should not have been tried and that, uh, uh, and that, that uh, uh, obviously, um, for which the country paid a pretty high price. And so, uh you you touched this already that there is not only the uh, American and the British model in contrast to a kind of uh, Asian model that there are countries in between and um, in, in your pieces uh, that you wrote and I, I read um, you talk a little bit more than you did in your in, in introduction uh, now uh, so maybe you can uh, see if something about that because uh, countries like Germany if you look at everything in balance they are how, how did it economically how did it uh, in in fighting the pandemic uh, how did it in securing the lives of as many people as possible uh, did it quite well uh, and um, although we have any a lot to, to criticize on the performance of the austrian government uh, in a way we are just similar to the uh, very similar to the to the German performance. Uh, so uh, is this this third model, this let's say Central Europe uh, planned or organized capitalism model that we still have here in Germany, Austria, is this a, is is this a model where we can learn something about uh, also from the pandemic? Yeah, well, I, I I would I would hope so, and and this brings me to a, a point that I didn't make in my opening remarks, but that I I have uh, articulated in a, an article that just appeared uh, in the 50th anniversary issue of the magazine Foreign Policy, uh, and um, and in which I, again I'm in the business of making broad characterizations, and I hope the audience forgives me for uh, for doing that. That's what in some sense economists are 
trained to do. Uh, but here, here was here was the thesis I laid out, and and again, I, it is a thesis with has a certain amount of uh, presumption in it from from a familial point of view. But uh, since you mentioned my father in your introduction, I'm I'm going to bring him in here, uh, and that is to suggest that there was a certain model uh, of industrial corporation. Uh, that uh, was articulated uh, and that was the predominant model in the United States in the 50s and 60s and into the 1970s. And that was described uh, uh, by my father and his the, the central uh, works, particularly the 1967 book, The New Industrial State. And this is of a, uh, as I say, a large industrial corporation operated over the over the long time horizon as a going concern, um, and supported by it, the financial institutions, by the public sector, counterbalanced uh, by trade unions and by uh, consumer interests, and by a somewhat autonomous scientific and uh, state, which uh, uh, gives it a structure of regulation that uh, uh, that then helps set the direction for the future technological change. Uh, uh, and this was a model that was hollowed out and eroded in the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, and in, you know, in at least in parts of Europe as well, but mainly uh, it was a you know, the Anglo-American model of, of, of financial dominance, financialization, financial globalization, which meant that uh, the currencies went up uh, and uh, imports came in, industrial activity was curtailed, and you got this kind of uh, bimodal economy with us highly unequal with poles of enormous wealth uh, uh, in, in finance and technology, and the rest of the economy largely in post-industrial services of various kinds. Um, <coughs> That wasn't what happened in uh, Germany, and uh, you can, I, I would say in some respects, uh, Germany, which was a country where my father had some direct influence, I mean, it was him after, he after all drafted the speech of hope in 1946 that, that set the terms for the initial terms for the uh, creation of the Federal Republic. It was given by Secretary Burns in Stuttgart. Um, they, uh, in Japan, which I haven't mentioned, um, was another case where he had uh, both direct and indirect influence. It was some of his close collaborators who really set the terms of the, helped set the terms of the occupation and the structure of post-war Japanese uh, reconstruction. Korea, which is a model of quite similar to the Japanese model, and, and actually I've learned recently that that there were there were influential forces in Korea that were also reading my father. And of course, the big one is China. Uh, and we don't really think about this, but uh, there is some work, and it's worked by a young scholar, a German scholar, Isabella Weber, uh, who uh, did an amazing amount of field work in China on the post Mao uh, period, the early post Mao period, and discovered uh, something that I also encountered, but I didn't really have the context to understand it, which is that they'd made a very close study of uh, the price control strategy and the industrial strategies. Uh, in which my father was involved in the United States, and they were, and they, 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 they chose uh, they to forego the Big Bang, Milton Friedman uh, financialization and, and deregulation, privatization that afflicted Russia, uh, and that uh, had you know, also dominant was also dominant in the U.S. and the U.K. in favor of a gradualist uh, approach that maintained their industrial core industrial capacities and built on them. And so you have, you have in some sense, I'm, I'm inclined to call this whole, the, 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 these countries and including Germany and Austria uh, as uh, I'm, I'm inclined to claim them under the umbrella of the Galbraithian mm -hmm. states uh, uh, with, with who preserved Gal, uh, industrial corporations that continued to evolve technical capacity and what they did. And, and that, that's an extraordinarily important thing because it means that you have an advantage that really can't be can't be taken away. Uh, whereas it's easy to erode it if you if a corporation is focused on short term profits and is uh, cost cutting. Uh, and I, I, I would gather I haven't got the details completely under my belt. But if you look at what happened with the vaccines, uh, Sanofi appears to have been a, a victim of a cost cutting campaign, which uh, decimated its research capacity. Uh, and in favor of, uh, of short-term financial results, with the result uh, that um, the, the French are, are, are um, if they're not out of the running, well behind uh, in, in, the, in the race for a vaccine. And that, of course, is the country that pioneered vaccination and had uh, a um, you know, 
uh, an enormously important presence in the field. It's a, a bit of a tragedy that it happened there, or not a bit of a tragedy, it's a big tragedy uh, that, uh, that, that uh, their, their capacity was, was undermined by what is essentially neoliberal uh, approach to, to industrial strategy. Yeah, there, now we can say there is this neoliberal uh, approach in, let's say, normal economic times, uh, and there is a more welfare uh, or a Galbraithian approach in a, mm -hmm. uh, in a normal time. But what I thought about months ago already was if, if there is not only also this Galbraithian moment uh, uh, with, in, in times of, of of a real extraordinary crisis, uh, because I remembered uh, my, my my lecture or my reading of the of the biography of your father, um, mm -hmm. where he wrote a lot about his time during the war. And during the war, he was responsible for uh, not only the Price Commission. This also had implications. It, it, it was war economy, <laughs> uh, uh, where you have to deal with uh, sh sh shorting of goods and, uh, and the, the allocation of goods, uh, the allocations also of uh, of workers. Some workers are soldiers, uh, and you have to deal uh, with the necessities of a country uh, that needs at first, on the one hand, goods, and on the other hand, uh, uh, soldiers uh, and on the other hand, weapons to fight this war. Mm -hmm. So is a situation of uh, a deep crisis and a health crisis, you mentioned already, where we have to uh, not, where we cannot, where we cannot uh, let the markets decide uh, about masks and we cannot let mask markets uh, decide about uh, vaccines. Uh, is that, is this a Galbraithian moment uh, in this sense? Well, a, a couple of observations. One is that the that of course what part of the point here is that the con countries that didn't think of this in terms of moments, but rather in terms of ongoing structures, were much better positioned uh, to deal. That's un unquestionably true, uh, and that's a, the thing that that uh, basically unifies the more successful experiences and separates them from the less successful ones. Uh, but yes, uh, the, 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 my my father's career had its moments of crisis. Uh, and at those times, what was interesting is that there was a body of, uh, of people who could be called upon who actually understood the underlying functions of uh, functioning of the economy. Uh, this was, they were, they were known as economists, but they would not be recognizable mm -hmm. to the economics professors of today. Uh, my father was far from being alone in this. I mean, it was people like Simon Kuznets uh, had developed the national income accounts, uh, was involved in the war production board. Uh, and one could go down a list of, of the of, of the senior figures of, of, of the later generation of 50s and 60s in academic life who played a role, Vasily Leontief, uh, Chowling Kukmans, um, uh, and uh, there were corresponding figures actually in the Soviet Union, um, who could be brought on board uh, and, 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 and put to work very quickly uh, and make a significant contribution. I once asked my dad what, where he got 17,000 people to help administer price control in, in a matter of months. He said, land-grant colleges, I hired all the economics departments, um, all the economics professors, because they had, they had useful knowledge. They knew about transportation and housing and agriculture and industry, and then they knew about their regions. Um, and, um, and of course, if you look at economics departments today, what do they know? They know about what they learned in textbooks, and they have some mathematical models, and they and uh, they apply them to standard statistics. And this is not a group of people you could bring into a, a functioning a, a government and make it function. In fact, it's been it's been, it's been incapacitated. Yeah. yeah, it's been it's been actually uh, its capacity to be useful in a crisis has been really run down. One of the things that's interesting, and I have to say I've been um, just a little bit optimistic in the last few weeks about the incoming administration in the United States, something which happens to me very rarely, um, is that uh, there seems to have been a recognition uh, that you don't ask your economists for advice first. Uh, you decide what you're going to do and you line them up behind it uh, and you you take a you you put forward an, a, a wine ranging and ambitious program. This is what President Biden has done, 
uh, and uh, and and then you you get the economists who, if they were asked their own brothers, would have been very much cautious and hesitant and and ha full of half measures to propose. You ask them to line up behind it, which, by and large, being good soldiers, they do, uh, which uh, I think has really changed uh, the, uh, the, the the dynamics, uh, at least in the development of economic policy. We, we, this is the first uh, you know, Democratic Party government uh, in many years that wasn't uh, negotiating with itself and 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 cutting back on uh, basically presenting half measures and then having them cut further by dealing with the Republicans. They might not get everything they want, but at least they are moving and they, 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 they're, they're making, uh, they're laying out what actually does need to be done. And if they can't get it, it's the, well, it's that's, that's going to be the other signs for the other side to, to, uh, to answer for. That might be um, a, a kind of surprise uh, for some people in our audience, because um, uh, many people expect it. And it's also in a way of in the commentaries in the newspapers here uh, that the Biden uh, the Biden government uh, has to govern in the center because you have to split country and you have to unite and you have to unite to reach out for moderate uh, uh, conservatives. Um, so the expectation was uh, that uh, they won't govern in a very uh, very pronounced way. Um, and in a very progressive way. And so we are surprised now that uh, actually beginning with the inauguration speech of uh, Joe Biden, um, it is a very partisan uh, uh, administration. Uh, so you are, well, also, you are really optimistic that they will deliver more than we expected. I I'm also surprised. Uh, I didn't expect this, particularly given the way in which uh, the progressive wing of the party was swept aside uh, during the nomination process. But in some sense, you could see it coming uh, that as the campaign developed, Biden developed, uh, I think, some confidence in his approach, which was very restrained, very sober, uh, and the absolute uh, most complete contrast to the incumbent. And then, of course, he won. And then uh, he, uh, with uh, uh, help from, uh, from my former student, Stacey Abrams, who has been absolutely a critical role in mobilizing uh, voters in the state of Georgia, they, 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 they were able to, um, to give control of the Senate to the Democrats. Uh, and then, uh, then the Re Republicans uh, were led uh, to uh, a state of uh, real disarray, almost, almost internal destruction uh, by Trump's refusal to accept the election and his mobilization of a, a kind of rabble that uh, nobody would want to be associated with, nobody in the right mind anyway. Uh, and so an opportunity came and Biden actually seized on this before the inauguration with a speech laying out his economic program and then the inauguration and then right afterwards as well as he moved forward on a whole range of things. I would not call it a part governing in a partisan way. What he, what he did was to say, okay, I am now the president. This is the problem. This is how we have to deal with it. Uh, and I invite everybody to, I mean, it, was, it wasn't the, the partisan program in some sense, uh, but it was, a, okay, we really is a national emergency and we need to, we need to uh, address it in a way which is self-evidently serious. And if we do that, perhaps people will take us seriously. Uh, and that's a perception, that, um, and that's a, a very mature perception actually, which uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's good to see. It, uh, it really is the kind of judgment you know, that you would expect from someone who's been around or you would hope for from someone who's been around for a long time uh, and knows that this is, this, is, this is his throw, this is his chance. Uh, so, uh, so you would, you would uh, say this, this crisis is really also a chance in, that, in, this, in this sense because in normal times uh, it, would be, it would have been much more difficult to bring forward such a program, but in this uh, moment it was easier because you can say uh, it's a, it's a, it's a abnormal, uh, really difficult situation and uh, there you have to act huge. Yes, and a lot of lot of things broke his way in, in, the, in the last few months, which is remarkable, not an unexpected. Uh, but 
also, um, you know, one has to sort of game this out a little bit further. Um, a lot of people, myself included, expected that the Biden uh, administration would be a very transitional event, um, a replay of the Obama administration, that it would be uh, necessarily set back and even wiped out by the mid in the midterm elections, losing control of, of the House and perhaps also of this, depending on what, what the balance is in the Senate. Could, uh, and, and that it would then be hobbled for the final two years, and then you would have a return of a of a much of a of, of a new new form of Trumpism. Mm -hmm. This is not necessarily the. It could still happen, but it is not necessarily the uh, the, the trajectory now. Uh, and by setting forward an ambitious program at a moment when things could hardly be worse. I mean, we're losing almost 4,000 people a day uh, to the pandemic. Uh, and uh, and, and the, the previous administration has clearly been discredited as, a, as, 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 as incompetent on a whole range of things. But at the same time, uh, they, the vaccines are here. Uh, they are moving in this country. The U.S. and the U.K. Interestingly enough, uh, have the have uh, the worst experience in managing the pandemic, and so far the best uh, in getting uh, getting people vaccinated. So at some you know, level, we know, we know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah, know. Uh, so at some level, uh, there was a moment when when having the advanced sectors uh, pays, you know, begins to pay a dividend, and so. To the extent that you combine that with an effective support for society, and what Biden proposes is not yet a reconstruction or growth program or a Green New Deal or anything like that, it's, he's very clearly identified it as a rescue program, meaning we're going to try and prop everybody up for the next six months until we get the pandemic, try to get the pandemic under control in that period, six months, a year, whatever it takes, uh, but to keep the society uh, you know, uh, more or less stable, which actually was done over the last year with the CARES Act and uh, just by providing people with enough cash. Uh, and that, uh, you know, and that makes a lot of sense. It is possible that if you look down the road a year and a half, people will say things started getting better just about now. Uh, and uh, maybe we give this administration a new lease on life in the midterm elections. And we have, you know, four years, in which case, you begin to develop some momentum and maybe you can begin to say, make a, the kind of case for the reconstruction uh, of the economy that I was talking about earlier, where you, where you say, okay, the, they have these capabilities in the advanced sectors, they've got to be put to public purpose, they've got to be put to energy conversion, they've got to be put uh, to climate mitigation so that we have, and you've got to build on, on the what the pandemic's already achieved in terms of reorienting work-life balance and getting people working from home and making use of the internet and much less of the airlines and much as I love coming to Vienna, I'm, you know, there's a, there's a certain energy saving and involved in doing this on, on, on fiber optics um, and so on. Um, and then you think about, okay, how do we get people back to work? We need to have a new model of job guarantee and a new model of cooperative uh, structures in the services sector so that we can rend be, rebuild our urban cores, which are now a big mess, um, full of boarded up storefronts and depressing scenes. Uh, and then the financial issues that I mentioned, there, you say, okay, well, somehow we've got to get people make a fair resolution that's fair both to debtors, debtors and to and to vulnerable creditors, a lot of small landlords, for example. Uh, you have to work out something that that that, that resets all of this. Um, if you do that, and you have the people, you know, behind you, at least a modest majority, then you know they. The, uh, you've left a pretty good record uh, for you know, 2024 and beyond. Uh, so I know it's, it's not I don't say this up is likely that things will come out. Most, most, most of my experiences in politics have ended in tears and I fully expect this one will too. Uh, but uh, it's not impossible that you can find a path through it, which is much better than we thought was going to happen six months ago, at least that I thought. You talked about the tears, but maybe there is um, there are some already some indications that it's uh, it, uh, uh, that it's it might be now 
better than other ex than than former experiences. And we also see it in Europe. We also see it in Europe. It's very clear that this idea that uh, uh, market market liberalization, market decentralization, it's not the time for this. Uh, this idea. It's the time of the idea that uh, uh, that. Uh, stable government structures um, had to save us and have to take care that, uh, that the society is working and that the economy is working and um, uh, for sure we are in a way maybe also in a better shape but what uh, in in relation to that because of this austrian and german scheme of kurzarbeit uh, short work uh, um, uh, this uh, sh short work to, to to save employments and 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 jobs um, but for sure many people now have uh, also in austria and i think the same like in the in germany and in the us uh, the fear that they are companies get bankrupt that their jobs get lost uh, at least in the show in the in the mid middle of time and in the long range medium term and in the long range uh, people also have uh, the fear that uh, the public debt is overwhelming now we have 120 per percent of the gd uh, debt of gdp maybe sometime uh, so what would you uh, tell these uh, people who have these reasonable uh, fears? Well, first thing I would say is that it's beyond past time uh, to recruit a new generation of economists that is actually brought up in connection with some connection to the real world on these matters. Uh, there are things that are reasonable to be worried about. People obviously have a reason to be worried about their own financial situation, about their jobs. Um, and there are things that are not reasonable to be worried about. Uh, and, uh, the econ economics profession has spent a lot of time and effort uh, misleading people into uh, false neuroses, essentially, over matters uh, like the public debt of a, of, a, of a powerful country such as Germany or uh, the United Kingdom or the United States. Um, obviously, if you're Greece uh, and you're indebted in euro to French and German banks uh, and you're under the thumb of the um, European Commission and the European uh, Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund, your debt is a problem you can't escape, uh, except by extreme measures. Uh, but if you're the United States or the UK or, uh, or, or the European Union as a whole, or China uh, or Japan, uh, then they, any realistic person uh, who looks at the situation says, well, uh, this is a, this 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 problem is a, is a shibboleth. It's a myth. Uh, that Japan's total public debt is 200 percent of GDP. Its interest rate is zero. Why is that? Uh, and Japan hasn't had any problem doing things. Have a look at China. Uh, just laid down, I don't know, 20,000 kilometers worth of high-speed rail over 15 years. Paid for how? Uh, you know, they, was, if they'd been worried about their public debt, they wouldn't have gotten the first uh, bit of that off the ground. Uh, yeah. One can go down. And then it comes back to something Keynes said many years ago, that uh, anything you can actually do, you can afford. Once you've built it, it's there. It can't be taken away from you. And that's the spirit we need to deal, we need in dealing with with the challenges ahead, climate change in particular, but the broader question of, in, of employment structures. And we need to have practical people who think about these problems from an engineering standpoint. And the engineering issues are hard. Uh, they are not going to be resolved easily. The question of how you organize energy consumption so you stay within some bounds. So you just add renewable energy on top of the fossil fuels you haven't gotten forward. Uh, going forward in terms of what you need to do. So these, those problems need to be addressed. And people who have, you know, whose thinking is in terms of financial uh, models and financial constraints, um, they need to be shuffled off the stage. Um, or if they have to be on the stage, they should be given talking points that they uh, that are in contrast what they've been saying all these years. Uh, you know, people like me are, you know, are where I'm on the margin of the economics profession because I've been saying unfashionable things for a long time. Um, maybe maybe so, now it, it, it becomes fashionable. Uh, no, the, no, the fate of people <laughs> like me is to be left on the margins and to be, have uh, you know, other people take up. But I, there's a, a, a law which I refer to as Galbraith's law. And this is mine rather than my father's. That, that in economics, a thought has not been thought until the right person has thought it. Uh, and uh, you know, some of us are the, not the right people. So other people pick them up. That's all right.
<laughs> yeah. Uh, so maybe last question because we well, be, before we mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. let the audience uh, involved. Um, um, the last question would be uh, all you said now, I, and also what I read uh, before was so I have the impression if the if the government would say we take a lot of billions and trillions in the hand uh, to save uh, to save uh, income and to uh, stabilize. Uh, consumer demand, that would be okay, for sure, and it's necessary, but it's, it would be not enough. We should uh, discuss, or we should be very, um, uh, very clear uh, for what reasons we need, uh, for what we use the money. Uh, so we have to build a new economy uh, uh, for the future. One word that was happily, and I was delighted to see this, not in the president-elect's uh, presentation of his program on economics was this terrible word stimulus, uh, which I find loathsome. Uh, it is a word which, first of all, suggests that all that's required is you inject some adrenaline or put fuel in the tank, that nothing's wrong with the engine, nothing's wrong, with the, there's no underlying problem. Uh, it's just an energy issue. Uh, and uh, that you're going to go right back to wherever it was you were doing before. And there's at least a clear recognition in the in the language the president and president-elect biden and president biden is using that this is not the case that we have to we have to think about where we're going to go we have to have someone uh, we have to rebuild the engine and we have to have somebody behind the wheel who's capable of doing a little bit of steering thank you very much ah, that was such a relief i mean i just felt like a cloud was lifted and then that the press still talks about it in terms of stimulus they're very reflexive but at least if anybody's thinking about the words they're using, they've moved on from that. Um, and that's where we need to have, uh, you know, we need to bring in a whole generation of, of bright minds who are prepared to think hard about, about exactly what, what needs to be done. Um, and that's not just true in the US, it's true in Europe and true, uh, you know, true all over the, all over the world. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Maybe we start now with the with the questions of our of, of our audience. And I here have already one question that is so uh, totally it, it it maybe it's mm -hmm. really for that moment for for that what you said before. It's uh, it's of our friend uh, Kurt Bayer, and he's writing most economic strategies today today are defensive. Should they not simultaneously contain active elements to build the future economy? So um, actually, you said it already, but maybe you will. Uh, you want to um, to figure it out a little bit more? Yes, um, and I'll I'll elaborate at least on, on the connection I make to that thought uh, is that one of the problems that we still have to overcome here is the notion that. Uh, that we're caught up in some kind of competitive struggle amongst major nation states. Uh, and this is absolutely not the case as a planetary environment. First of all, the, 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 the military conflicts that are abroad in the world are utterly trivial uh, by historical standards. Uh, they should be easily managed. Uh, the military resources are that, we're, that we, and particularly the United States, are uh, putting toward uh, this purpose, including a vast modernization of a completely useless nuclear arsenal. These resources must be conserved. They must be put to some other use. Uh, it has to be taken out of the completely unproductive uses. And for that, you need to have some, um, you know, you need to establish uh, a working relationship amongst the, uh, the, the, the nation states that are really going to be decisive in the future of the planet as a whole. Uh, and this supersedes all of this. Uh, we were in a moment in the US when we were in it, we have major agitation to inflame uh, the tensions uh, to make things into a competitive struggle uh, when it's absolutely imperative that we have a, a, a cooperative arrangement. Uh, I, I, I do recall the days when, 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 um, when Austria was the, uh, was the focal point for attempting to build up a, 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 a collaborative relationship in the world. Uh, and uh, so it may be, it may be that we, we will have to see some leadership from, from some of the um, some of the smaller powers with, with whose who's, uh, who's heads are still firmly uh, located on their shoulders on these matters. 
Äh, äh, Jutta, jetzt eine Frage an dich. Haben wir noch andere Fragen von Facebook oder so? Um, Moment, also es gibt Facebook um, ein Statement, eher als eine Frage, aber ich werde es trotzdem mal durchgeben. Sorry, in English now. Um, the statement on Facebook is on the possibility of a consultative as the fourth power of democracy and why are journalists largely, largely ignoring it? Oh, sorry, Robert, can you... Uh, I, I missed the I thrust really of it. I didn't really realize the question now because I... I thought it, is to, it was to you, for you. Uh, Entschuldige nochmal, wie lautet die Frage? Um, why are journalists, journalists largely ignoring the possibility of a consultative as fourth power of democracy? Oh, okay. That, that would, um, I'm not sure if it's a question to, for me, but it's, I'm also not sure if it's a question for you. It's actually not really a question for, for, for our issue here. Uh, but uh, for sure, this is a, is a, is a quite interesting issue. Uh, um, interesting question and issue uh, where many countries and many also municipalities uh, are already experiencing, if, if I understand right your question right, um, uh, experiencing with consultative bodies uh, been, been years uh, elected bodies um, and elected political boards and I think it there are there are good 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 uh, good experiences in uh, let's let's I, I talked with responsibles people responsible for the for the Bürgerrat uh, citizens consultative in uh, in 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 Danzig I think and uh, there are also experiences in in Ireland and other countries I I think um, Many, many uh, governments, at least on the uh, on the municip municipal level and on the on the regional level, um, realize that already. And I would say, as far as I can, <laughs> I can answer. Uh, uh, also, journalists are realizing that. If you want to ask me how, why they don't don't write more often about it mm -hmm. uh, for sure it, it, it might be um, it might be a, a good idea of the on the other hand on the one hand on the other hand uh, you can also write only write about the exper experience when it uh, when it happens uh, so it's uh, for sure you can do that uh, um, if you for example make re reports about how how they did it in Danzig and maybe we should do this more often you are right. And now we have some more questions here. The pandemic, uh, the pandemic is proving that global solutions are becoming not only necessary, but urgent. What is the US view on that? And how prepared is the US to get people involved in consensual global solutions um, in regard to economy, climate, pandemic? Well, we've just come through a period in the US in which global solutions have been very much out of fashion uh, in favor of, a, of a, a very strongly nationalist view of things. Uh, that's, uh, I mean, to say the US has a view, of course, the country is very much divided. I think the new administration on the plus side uh, wants to have uh, a more, uh, you know, a broader and more cooperative approach. On the minus side, uh, so far, uh, they uh, keep participants in a global approach are uh, being viewed very much as adversaries. Uh, and the, the notion that they should be viewed as partners uh, and cultivated as partners and not necessarily catered to, uh, but uh, that one should look for effective ways to achieve common objectives. Uh, has not, uh, is, 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 is something which is difficult uh, to articulate in American politics. I'm not entirely convinced that the new administration won't go ahead and look for those things, uh, and I wish them well, uh, but navigating the, the, the political realities uh, is, is, going to be a, is, is going to be a challenge, and I hope, I hope they, 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 they make the effort. Okay. Uh, Jamie? Um Ah, yeah. There's one more question on Facebook. It's one big problem revealed in the US is the vulnerability of our democracy. 
um, to an absence of goodwill. How can we move forward if we can't make this assumption? Uh, make the assumption of, I'm sorry, of the, of, 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 of make the assumption of goodwill? Yes, if we can't, if we cannot make it. Well, in all of relations between nation states, there's an, an you know, you know, an element of, of confidence building that has to be developed. Uh, there has to be an, 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 a, you know, a reasonable assessment of reliability. Uh, and one has to overcome uh, the tendency, on at least some part, to make political advantage out of, out of inflaming tensions. Uh, and we're definitely seeing a fair amount of that in American discourse today. Uh, so the answer to your question is the building of goodwill is a, you know, is a delicate process. Destroying it is relatively easy. Uh, and we've seen an enormous amount of destruction uh, over in, in, recent, in recent times. Uh, and I'm not just saying in the past American administration, but going back 15, 20 or more years, 30 years maybe. Uh, and that is something we, we, we're starting behind uh, the start line on this and have to, we have to work on it, work on it in good conscience and, 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 and with open eyes. Jamie, a last question from uh, my side, um, yeah, because we also talked now about a little yeah. bit about nationalism or national uh, um, competition or something like that. As somebody who, uh, who was involved also in this Greek drama, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and about uh, in the situation of the U European Union, let's say 10 years ago or five years or six years ago, um, okay. where we have this huge uh, anti European spirit in European politics, let's put it in that way, and the germ very and the German government, for example, that was very strong on us on, on austerity um, and uh, on destroying the Syriza government. Uh, how would you? Uh, how would you charge on the on the uh, on the politics of the European Union in the last year, uh, especially also in the politics about uh, of the German government? This is quite a contrast uh, to that what happened ten years ago, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Especially I, in economic terms. Well, let's bring this back to the tradition of Bruno Kreisky and the. Uh, uh, and the social democratic forces that, that uh, you know, brought Austria uh, and Europe generally out of the war and built up uh, some of the most stable and prosperous and democratic societies that have ever been seen. Uh, the European Union is paying now a fearful price uh, for having uh, a largely, um, I wouldn't say obliterated, but uh, really moved away from those traditions uh, in favor of a kind of neoliberal market oriented uh, uh, economistic vision of the world uh, and a policy framework, which is best described as ordo liberal with um, uh, 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 something that really goes back to the austerity of the interwar period to the rise of fascism in important respects. Uh, and uh, a kind of, uh, and of course people are gonna lose confidence uh, when they are, their needs are not met uh, and when they can see plainly that the, the state structures and international structures are not are not serving their interests, that's a problem we've got in the United States as well. I think to a degree the U.S. has modest advantages because we, it, it, to, to to a degree we have not moved. Uh, we exported these doctrines, but we didn't necessarily adopt them uh, at the level of the states and localities in the U.S. to the, nearly the same extent that they, they became pervasive in Europe. Uh, we have a more flexible relationship with a central bank, and in other ways, the, and a more sort of an instinctively Keynesian response to trouble. Um, but uh, and Europe has got to. Uh, there's, a, as I said at the time when I was working on Greece, the fundamental problem is, a, is, a, is to bring ideas into contact with the real world, um, and that was what's what that was not what was done when in the, in the Greek crisis. Uh, and you know, the, the, the costs continue to be paid um, in, a, in, a, you know, in a very serious way. So this is something we all, the people who traffic in ideas like, like, like you and me and, uh, and the Kreisky Forum, this is part of our mission is to keep advancing what we think but, is right. But in the last year, that was that what, I, what I wanted to ask and maybe it wasn't so clear. I have the impression that the, that, uh, that uh, the policymakers in the European Union uh, uh, 
went to another path, at least a little bit, this huge European rescue package, package this, um, um, this also uh, European uh, credit uh, system to uh, uh, common sure. European credit system uh, to support uh, Italy and other countries uh, to to go away from this blame game that the that somebody it's somebody's fault if they have a problem and we shouldn't help them uh, uh, they went away a lot uh, and, and if you compare uh, Let's say Olaf Scholz to Wolfgang Schäuble. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is a change in European politics. Almost anything in comparison to Wolfgang Schäuble, Schäuble is a change, right? Uh, although it's not, it, I, it's not easy. Yeah, it's not difficult to I, be better than Wolfgang. I Schäuble. have to say, I have to say about Herr Schäuble is that at least he told us what it was on his mind. He was very clear and honest. Uh, but yes, uh, the, if, if Europe is finally moving onto a path of a more realistic and pragmatic policy, this was a step in the right direction. Uh, lots more steps yet to, yet to come. Let's, let's move things along. Okay, there are Thank two more questions. Sorry to interrupt, Robert. Mm -hmm. um, should I give them to, um, through to you? Maybe, yes. Uh, yes. The first one is about the military spending. And if you think the military spending could be better used and how you see the major powers working collaboratively rather than as they are now highly competitively. Okay, for about 20 years, I chaired the board of an organization called Economists for Peace and Security uh, and made the case that military spending would almost always be better used. But if you look at the actual contact, uh, content of military spending in the United States and we're the dominant military spender in the world, it's obvious that uh, much of it uh, is, uh, you know, it, it caters to institutional forces uh, and to false uh, imperatives, and in some cases to exaggerated fears. Uh, uh, the one I will point to immediately is the so-called modernization of the nuclear arsenal. This is something which should not happen uh, and is vastly expensive and only increases enormous danger uh, that some of these weapons might eventually, somebody might say, well, we've got them now, we've modernized them, maybe we should use them, uh, which would be a calamity for the planet. Uh, and that, that's something on which, which, which we've given much too little attention. Uh, but there are many other things, and we're going to talk about generations of fighter planes and so forth, which are uh, built to, war, to meet military challenges that were relevant in the Second World War, and, and maybe to a degree in some later conflicts, but are hardly relevant uh, to the uh, kinds of, of, uh, of national security situations we face now. Uh, and indeed, you know, much of what uh, it passes for this kind of thing is not necessary anyway. It can be, can be dealt with by diplomatic means. We, do, we have a world in which we urgently need to reduce uh, the uh, use of these resources and the tensions that are associated with them. Uh, and that is a matter for, for diplomacy and for uh, economic integration, people to people contact and for a general changing of ideas. Uh, and that, that's an, an important piece of what needs to happen if we're going to have resources to deal with the challenges that we actually do face on a planetary basis. Okay, thank you. The last question I have here is um, on the stimulus checks. And it is, um, if you noticed how the promised $2,000 um, stimulus check went recently, uh, were recently reduced to $1,400 based on the excuse that $600 were already handed out. And what do you think about that? Well, I, 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 this is not to me the most important question. Uh, there's going to be some compromises here. 600 has been done. If 1400 get done on top of that, that adds up to 2000. Uh, so I know there's, there's, there's some political pressure on this, but for me, the fact that there's aid for state and local governments that, is deep, that are deeply uh, in, in deep trouble as a result of collapsing tax revenues, the fact that there is extended unemployment insurance, which targets people who are actually out of work, uh, and, the, uh, and the fact that there's a major initiative for, to build up a public health infrastructure, uh, these things are all of crucial, of crucial importance. Uh, one thing we know learned about, about 
sending checks to people is you can always write another one. Uh, so it's it, it, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. Obviously, it's popular. It has a political base. Uh, um, but a lot of those checks, I mean, they're they're very useful and they they will they will they will help people get through this period. But you can you can take this piece by piece, uh, in my view. And if I were to compromise, see a compromise on that, it's not gonna, I'm not going to lose an enormous amount of sleep on it. If we get the other things that are really essential to keep um, keep the country and the society together uh, while the pandemic comes under control. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us here uh, for this talk. Um, and uh, hopefully we will see uh, as uh, we can meet in, let's say, one year uh, when we survived and when we fought the plague uh, and if we got the vaccine and we are safe. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, everybody who, who was with us here in the web webinar and who watched us um, uh, on Facebook Live. And uh, yes, we will see again. Um, at Kreisky Forum Digital and sometimes also hopefully uh, physically in our house in Vienna. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, and thank, thanks very, very much, Robert, my friends, and uh, do, do stay safe. We have, still have to get through, uh, get through this together. Fighting. <laughs>